The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast, What If Your Institution Could Hit the Reset Button on, e on its e-learning program. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we move through the presentation today, if you have any questions at all, enter them into the question box. We'll be keeping an eye on the question box, and then if there's any Thing that we need to jump in and ask the panelists about, we will. Otherwise, we'll hold the questions until after all of the presentations and the moderated conversation and then get to your questions. The webcast is being recorded. You will receive a link shortly after the live webinar and then it will also be posted on the WCET website next week. If you'd like to follow along with the PowerPoint presentation, you can download it in the handout box. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter back channel. If you'd like to follow along, the hashtag is WCET Webcast. Today's conversation will begin with brief introductions. The panelists will share background on their e-learning programs and goals. We'll have a moderated discussion with the panelists, move to your questions, and then we will conclude. Again, if you have any questions, enter them into the question box. Today's moderator is Sasha Thackerberry. She's Vice Provost in Digital and Continuing Education at Louisiana State University. Sasha, why don't you go ahead and do a brief introduction and then we'll move on to self-introductions by the panelists. Fantastic. Um, thank you for having me. I love WCET. I am Vice Provost of Digital and Continuing Ed at LSU, and we are in active development of um, an online program, series of programs rather, with some very aggressive enrollment goals. Previous to this, I had the privilege of working at Southern New Hampshire University, and before that, at Cuyahoga Community College uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and so the community college environment is very close to my heart. So um, before we get to the rest of the introductions, we wanted to do a little bit of framing as to why this topic was of particular interest. And part of it, of course, is the post-traditional learner is our new normal. So the demographics of our learners are changing across the spectrum, really, not just in the community college environment. Um, even, even at institutions like LSU, they're becoming more diverse. We're seeing more returning learners. There is also this need for continual training and upskilling. So not all of it is going to be in long form degrees. We're also seeing increasing consumer interest in some alternative credentialing components and also how those, those provide pathways to a full degree or to a credit certificate. One of the things that's applicable to our, our concerns moving forward as, a, as really a field is that um, what, what constitutes a quality online program? Um, there was a, a high pub, highly publicized um, HLC uh, had declined the extension of additional online programs out in the Maricopa district. And there were some very specific reasons why, in particular, some of the support areas for faculty, um, the learning environment, the consistency of the learning environment, the ability to have quality control and quality assurance. Um, and those are some of those core concerns that were expressed by the HLC. But there are also a lot of other tensions generally in the online program space, including um, decentralization versus centralization. So how are units structured? Are they distributed or, or are they uh, a core part of academic services? And then also, how are we creating these new online programs or reconfiguring them to be really student-centric um, versus institutional-centric in a way uh, how, how can we transform the institution to meet the needs of the students as opposed to uh, forcing the students to really navigate the complex and historical systems that are in place at most of our institutions. So it really isn't about the technology itself. Um, it is about how we use the technology to support students who are increasingly not having a point in time educational experience, but really a lifelong 
uh, educational experience that requires new types of learning, relearning, uh, unlearning to relearn, all of those really fascinating lifelong learning um, paradigms that, that we're moving into altogether. And then on our next piece, we really want to think about how hard it is and what components go into it and what would you do differently if you knew then what you know now, right? And so the joke here, of course, is Willy Wonka is if you think online learning is hard, you should try advising, but that is really important. So an online program isn't a, just a collection of online courses, though at some institutions that is how it has evolved. So looking at things like institutional structure, ideally how would you set that up versus how it is now? How would you handle academic governance, the development of academic programs, how to provide faculty support, support for learning design, even marketing and recruitment. How do you keep students once you have them? What is your advising model? All of these components uh, so, sort of developed in the historical context of institutions. And so knowing what we know now, um, we're gonna have a really robust conversation about how we would get there on the other end and what are some of our main concerns at each of our institutions. So we're moving forward to our other introduction. So Ryan, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then we'll go through the panel and, um, and then we're gonna hear a little bit about each, uh, each institution and, and then we'll move on to a conversation. So Ryan, do you just wanna do a brief introduction and then we'll move on to Abra and we'll go back for the um, sort of full institutional um, narratives. Perfect, thank you. My name is Ryan Faulkner. I am the Director of Online Learning Services at a new community college in, in Southeast Idaho. I have about 18 years experience in uh, higher ed, um, ed tech services being video conferencing to um, equipment uh, management and setup and the last uh, almost going on seven years has been in online learning, so thank you. Fantastic, um, Abra? I don't know if you, uh, we were having a, a couple of audio issues earlier, so Aubrey, if you're on the line, can you introduce yourself? If not, we'll uh, move on to Lorraine. All right, I think we'll jump to Lorraine and then we will move back to Aubrey when she joins us again. Lorraine, um, will you do a self intro? Sure, hi, I'm Lorraine Schmidt and I'm the Dean of Online Learning at Portland Community College. I've been at PCC um, for about 11 years on my first round and 12 years on my or, or on my second round, 12 on my first. And then I also worked at Chemeketa Community College, which is just about 30 miles south of Portland. And I guess I'm dating myself, but I, I've also been a WCE team member since probably 1994 or something like that. So been in the field for a while. Fantastic. Um, and we'll just go, go on into a little bit more about the background of your institution and where you are. Um, I know we have some information more specific to your area and we'd be interested in hearing about the setup of your institution and your online programs. Sure, I think we can go ahead and go to my next slide if that's all right. So to give you a sense for uh, the program at PCC, we are uh, one institution but we have four campuses under one college accreditation. So we've got one district president and four campus presidents and then we have decentralized actually both academic and student services administration, but on the academic side, just to give you an example, we've got four deans of instruction, 20 plus division deans, and about 120 department chairs. So that means we have like one math chair and one math dean at every campus. So just to kind of give you a sense of the complexity of the institution, and then a similar format as well for student services at the campuses. So the online learning division is actually centralized under the vice president of academic affairs and she reports to the district president. Um, so we're centralized in that way. And our funding comes from both general fund dollars as well as from a technology fee that's paid by all credit students and then an online course fee with just the online students uh, pay for. We do have uh, one faculty bargaining unit, so we were, we're unionized, and that union represents both full and part-time faculty, as well as a category of non-teaching faculty that we call academic professionals. 
Um, the program started in about 1994. I was part of that. And we currently offer transfer and associate of applied science degrees, as well as career pathways and other kinds of certificates one year and, and less. Um, in terms of the size and scope of our program, our collective FTE is about 5,300 annually, um, which represents about 24% of the credit of uh, credit FTE for the college. So you can see from the numbers on the slide, uh, the numbers of sections, disciplines, credit students, and faculty that we support through the program. And last year we had about 61,000 unduplicated enrollments or duplicated, excuse me, enrollments in our in our sections over the year. So in terms of student demographics, we've got more female students than uh, the campus only uh, student population. Um, we have a less diverse student population online with white students representing 70% of the online student population. Um, our students are older than on campus only students. So we actually pull apart the web only students who are the ones that don't take any courses on campus from the ones that either do both or only come to campus. Um, and the greatest um, number of students we have is in the age group between 30 and 39. So I'm sure we support many similar functions as a lot of your programs do, but I thought I'd just provide a little more context so you can see uh, what we do. We support basically four functional areas. The first area is academic excellence and support, which includes the course development and course development and quality, faculty development and training, accessibility and media, faculty mentoring, course design reviews, and so on. Uh, the second is course scheduling, which is a new endeavor for us. I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. And that was implemented just about over a year ago. Um, the third area is student success services. So we offer some services specifically for our web only students who don't take classes on campus. Um, and then other services we support uh, are for any PCC credit student at the college. Um, and last but not least, uh, we support technology management and um, provide student services for that. We don't use any of the information technology uh, services from the IT department at the college, so we're separate from them other than utilizing the network and having integration. So some examples of our efforts in the areas I just mentioned are this um, new scheduling as an annual course planning guide for online courses. So we don't have this for campus courses at all. So we were the first to kind of jump into this and we previously did not play any role in scheduling courses before this initiative. So some of you can probably imagine um, what kind of an endeavor that was, but we did it and it's been great for students. We also provide um, dedicated academic advising to our web only students. Um, we can't serve everyone. We have a pool of students over the course of a year of up to about 5,500 students. And we have two advisors and one advising coordinator to do that work. We also have a required start guide for first time online students. It's a combination of a readiness assessment with an orientation to the online program and courses and students can't register for their first online class the, until they've completed it. Um, we also do some specialized communication for online students um, and we provide a resource center uh, in our learning management system. Uh, the online tutoring and student help desk that we operate supports any uh, credit student at the college and we run that service seven days a week with extended coverage from our uh, LMS provider. So we're always trying to push the envelope on our campus counterparts and work on parallel tracks to support fully online students uh, with our resources and at the same time try to help move the campus uh, services forward to support all students. Um, I'm sure that you've probably said this at your college unless you have a, a full online campus, but um, we try to tell people that if they can support online students well, they're actually going to be supporting all students well. So while we aren't an online campus at this point, we've made strides in the last few years to have a more strategic and coordinated approach that focuses on equitable student success and an increased completion. So Sasha earlier mentioned that sort of struggle between centralized and decentralized, and we're in the midst of going through some of that ourselves. So we're in the second year of being in Achieving the Dream School, and our college president is very supportive of online learning. So he's especially passionate about how we serve marginalized students and how to integrate federal and state benefits to make um, higher education more accessible to students. 
and online can be um, a great part of that. So with the gentrification of the city of Portland and the high cost of living here, our demographics are changing and the student populations living around our campuses are really changing because marginalized folks and low income people are getting pushed out of what was traditionally the, the point of act, the, their closest access to our campus. I think that summarizes it for me. Great, thank you. Uh, Ryan, do you want to go through a little bit more about the College of Eastern Idaho? Sure thing. Um, so I, I feel a little, uh, I'm the new kid on the block here, it feels like. We are a, a brand new community college. Um, this, the College of Eastern Idaho was formally uh, founded as the Eastern Idaho Technical College in 1969. Uh, it's been, uh, the College of Eastern Idaho has been around for about a year now, but I think fall is our first kind of full semester just pushing out new courses, getting the general eds moving. Um, we are primarily a technical school with um, a very big medical um, portion of that school. And um, right now we are nestled between two universities, Brigham University of Idaho and Idaho State University. Um, so we're like an hour in you know, each way, north and south of those two schools, trying to find our, our niche, trying to find our fit in there. Since last year, our enrollment has in, is, is about doubled uh, since fall of last year. So we are sharply increasing um, staff-wise, uh, faculty-wise, and student-wise. We have one main campus, three out, outreach centers right now, and we're still trying to find our niche out in the rural areas and find those areas where we could hopefully help get uh, some more education out. Um, our online learning uh, is centralized, much uh, like at PCC, under the VP of Instruction Student Affairs. Uh, that person then reports to our president. Our online department currently consists of one employee, which would be me, and um, I do give a shout out to our IT help desk, even though we're somewhat separate. They have been really great about being the first line of support and helping me um, take in phone calls and work with faculty and make those relationships. Our first fully online courses at CEI began this summer of 2018, and I feel very grateful that uh, the president of our institution was one of our first online, uh, fully online teachers. Uh, he had a belief in this, and I was hired into this position on Jan, uh, January 2nd of this year, and uh, the canvas was very, um, very blank, and we're trying to go through all this, but that has been a huge, huge uh, relief, is to have the administration taking uh, taking the lead on where they want the program to go and, and, and be an example. So. Uh, as of now, for the fall of 2018, we're up to 12 fully online and eight hybrid courses. Roughly a third of our students um, fall into that, uh, that cat those categories. And I was just running through some of the numbers and our school is about a two to one female to male ratio um, overall. And uh, in looking at the enrollments for our fully online courses, we're right along that area as well. Um, right now we're focusing on a pathway to a fully online AA degree and, and looking at our um, general eds and getting those built up. We can go on to the next slide. Um, I'm kind of going in backwards. I talked about our online, um, but the main thing we're doing here and the reason that I'm grateful for the WCT for putting this on is we're actually not resetting anything. We are actually in the, the process of creation of an online program and online courses. Uh, when I took the job, I began by reaching out to other institutions within the state, some within um, some groups I had been uh, in a professional organization with, and I was uh, able to join the WCET uh, with this school here, and uh, that's been very uh, helpful, but um, I've been very grateful for the assistance of other uh, other institutions, the knowledge that they've provided, and I found that everybody in our field is amazingly helpful, which is great. Uh, we started by looking at the faculty buy-in. Uh, the, the leadership here wanted to find people that were open to, to the creation of a fully online course, not pushing people into doing it. So we're just trying to find the people that are interested in doing it and finding the way to support them. Creating and updating online policies and definitions has been uh, a big challenge. We're going through that. We are trying to work with uh, faculty on that and just make sure that we do this right the first time. We're also, as I said, formulating a plan to develop and create gen ed online courses. That way we'll focus on what our uh, AA degrees will look like and the first ones that we'll want to um, offer for our students. 
I'm also, along with the creating and updating online policies, really looking at the Northwest uh, guidelines and trying to figure out what are the best suggestions for online courses, as well as looking at um, how we can bring in quality assurance and, and talking to faculty about possibly looking to quality matters in those areas to get, to get moving and try to do this the best we can from the get-go. Uh, some of the things that we've been able to do here and we're still we're still focusing on getting those working and getting them up to up to speed is we've created a curriculum committee for all courses on campus uh, this is going to be very important for our online courses to make sure that we're going down the right direction and that there are um, peers looking into what we're trying to create we've we've uh, had one faculty member that's been amazing and uh, she has a uh, kind of created on the side a faculty online teaching group and it's moderated by her and it's a group membership for the for faculties of all disciplines at the school and I get to be a little bit of a part of it but it's great because that gives them a chance to talk about cross-disciplinary teaching and just getting uh, more familiar with the technology. We've also just created an online steering committee to start working on uh, some of the just the think about our definitions a little bit more and make sure that we've got more faculty involvement on that as well and um, looking at our policies making sure that we're all on the same page and I've just been lucky to have the opportunity to join some national and regional organizations to get to meet other people and I will conclude with the final slide of just I'm trying to hang on for dear life and enjoy this ride thank you thank you and now we have Abra um, at TCC Connect campus. And so Abra, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to talk just a little bit about what's happening at uh, TCC. Uh, TCC Connect campus is the sixth campus in our district. Uh, we're the only uh, online campus in the state of Texas. Uh, we have five face-to-face -face campuses here at uh, Tarrant County College and one online campus. The slides talk us a little bit about uh, decentralization uh, of our uh, academic structure. We were actually centralized uh, with TCC Connect. Uh, currently, we have one dean of academic affairs and we have two part-time deans that pretty much handles uh, all of our different areas uh, that we have our departments. We have four uh, different departments right now. We have... Um, and with that being said, we have one vice president of academic affairs uh, who oversees all of our uh, academic programs. Uh, our campus was actually uh, centralized, meaning that prior to TCC uh, Connect Campus, our online courses were spread out over all of the five courses. And the, the college made a decision to centralize online learning. And that's how TCC Connect became a campus. We started out as being an administrative unit, and in 2015, we became tax accredited, and we are on campus now, where we are responsible for all online learning as well as weekend college. Uh, and our weekend college program is designed where students can earn uh, their associate degree within the 18 months. Uh, just a little skip around a little bit. If you see there, we have our uh, we have approximately 3,500 FTEs uh, right now. We are offering 1,900 plus sections, and 100% of our students uh, are credit students uh, at, with TCC Connect. We do not offer uh, continuing education at this time. However, uh, the college is looking at um, TCC Connect campus being allowed to offer online continuing education courses. We currently have approximately 30 disciplines. Uh, we have 400 plus online faculty. Uh, and out of that, we have 19 full-time faculty members at this time and the other are uh, the on adjunct faculty. So I would say the majority of our sections are taught by adjunct faculty. And that sometimes causes poses a challenge for us because our faculty members are adjunct and so when we're trying to get them in for certain trainings or calling on them for certain trainings we have to really have great incentives to get our online faculty and sometimes to teach the courses and it sometimes limit us with the courses we are or the sections we're teaching because we have so many uh, adjunct faculty teaching the courses just a little demographics about tcc connect campus Currently, we have uh, a 
approximately 68.9% female were serving and 31.1% male students who were taking advantage of online learning. And 71% uh, of our students are age 25, uh, which we are, like many of the other campuses, are serving a large population of non-traditional uh, students. Right now, I mean, currently we have approximately uh, 20,000 student enrollments on the TCC Connect campus. All right. Next slide. All right, online accessibility uh, and media. All of our courses uh, that we're where we're teaching now, all the sections are ADA compliant, uh, and that's something that we're proud of. When we first um, took over online learning, all of our courses were not ADA compliant. However, they are uh, at this time. We had a former uh, vice president who was really concerned about making sure that that took place, and under their leadership, that happened, and under the leadership of Dr. Carlos Morales. Uh, online student services is actually my area, and that's something that uh, I enjoy uh, talking about, making sure that we have services, uh, those wraparound services and co-curricular services for our online students. Uh, one of the things that um, we do have, which is probably a little bit further down, we offer uh, online library, we have tutoring services, we have mentoring services online, and we also have a uh, Honor Society online. We have Phi Theta Kappa online. Uh, we have the first um, virtual Phi Theta Kappa chapter in our region. And that's something that we're really excited about. Currently, we have approximately 198 students who are members of PTK online. Uh, we have district wide student services uh, schedule coordination where we also work with our um, other five campuses to make sure that. All of the services that, that are provided, our students have the opportunity to take advantage of those services as well. And our student services here on the Connect campus is pretty small because we have a lean uh, staff and a lean operation. And so we really depend uh, heavily on our campus counterparts to kind of make sure that our students are receiving uh, the services that are available to all face-to-face -face students here at TCC. Uh, just a little bit about district-wide schedule coordination. Uh, when we, all of our scheduling uh, is really, it's something that we work with the entire district. Uh, with scheduling is not just a one campus uh, operation. Uh, we have online student workshops and the online student workshops are for our students who cannot come to campus or who do not wish to come to campus. Uh, and those workshops consist of time management, uh, how to read a de degree plan. Uh, basically, um, those type services that pretty much help students be successful uh, in their courses. One of the new workshops that the team presented this year is how to um, communicate with your teacher. You do not communicate with your professor as you would text your friend. And that went over very well, not only with our students, but our faculty members appreciated that uh, workshop series. Uh, we participate in community and academic outreach programs. Uh, this is, we really are not uh, a recruiting area, but we definitely market our program throughout uh, the county, uh, pretty much with YMCA's um, different uh, nonprofit organizations, different community events. We're there uh, sharing information. And we also uh, work on our campuses to share information about online learning on the other five campuses. Uh, we have academic advising online as well. Uh, we have 13 academic advisors uh, who are online. Those individuals participate in professional development workshop with the other face-to-face -face academic advisors. Uh, we have 13 online academic advisors and they're all part-time and sometimes that causes a challenge because they're not only uh, working with uh, our online population, but they also serve our face-to-face -face, uh, students. Our um, new student orientation is required for our first time uh, in college students and our students are taking uh, advantage of that, and we see that at perhaps 60%, approximately 60% uh, 
of those students are successful uh, in, the, in their classes, those who are uh, taking advantage of the stu new student orientation. We also have an online orientation that's optional. Uh, it's uh, presented to those students uh, through Blackboard for all of our students. Uh, our students can actually take advantage of online orientation at any time during uh, the semester. We have Tier 1 Student Support uh, Resource Center, where when our students are enrolled in class at any time, if they have any questions about Blackboard uh, or just, you know, how to chat or log in uh, to communicate and discuss uh, different areas of the, the subject, then we have individuals at our Resource Center who assist our online students. Currently, we have online proctoring support. Uh, we have not had that um, historically in the district. Uh, we've had online proctoring support for approximately two years now, and currently we're using Proctoria, and it appears to be working pretty well with our students and faculty. And I mentioned earlier, we have online tutoring, um, our faculty and student help desk. That's all handled through our student services unit. Fantastic. Thank you, Abra. Um, so in advance of this, we had picked out some themes that folks were really interested in weighing in on. And I'm going to riff on that a little bit based on some themes that I, I just picked up in what you all had shared about your programs. Um, but before I head into what I think was a, one of our biggest themes, which was really support, support for students and support for faculty, I wanted to touch just briefly on strategic support. So in, uh, in the le from the lens of the institution that you each are from, if you wouldn't mind just sharing a little bit about um, the over overall strategy for enrollment or um, online program expansion, just a, a little bit about where you're going from here. Just in, in order of appearance, Ryan, would you like to start? Well, as I stated, we're still kind of learning how we're, how we're moving on this. Um, we just actually have a new Vice President of Instruction and in Academic Affairs, and uh, I've briefly, it's been within the last week she's began, and I have been, in brief, been having conversations with her about what our audience is, who our audience is, how we're gonna find out how to better reach our students. Right now, we've just kind of taken the approach of we are focusing on, we're, we're, we're trying not to take on too much. And um, when I took the job and in, in one of my bullet points, I discussed how I started contacting people. I ended up uh, meeting people from basically all over the country. And the common theme I heard back about their programs and how they began them was that they kind of opened the floodgates, put a lot of uh, content out there. And then after a couple of years, the quality assurance um, uh, topic started coming up so we were trying to take this a little bit slower and hopefully try to get that quality piece or, or get our idea of our structure across the whole entire campus make sure that we're all on the same page and um, much like was discussed earlier about the um, accreditor the HLC accreditor and uh, the community college and one of the, the themes that popped out of that was there was very little standardization and there was some you know the the classes and the degrees they wanted to offer were 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 uh, needed, wanted, and were going to be great, but how are you going to get your faculty the services to teach the courses? So those are the types of things we're looking at, but um, it's been exciting to discuss um, ideas with the new uh, VPI about, you know, how, how can we better look at our student population and, and find the courses that will best fit our little niche, because um, it's kind of hard. We don't really want to compete with the big schools around us. Uh, we just want to find the services. There's plenty of need in our community, so that's kind of where we're we're kind of looking, a lot of things going on. That's fantastic. I think that uh, particularly at the very beginning here, and, and I'm um, in, a, in a strangely analogous situation here at LSU to some extent, is that the time that you put in on the front end is going to save you so much from the wild, wild west and, and trying to recraft processes and, and re-put those things in place. And actually, I just noticed on the slide, we're actually, uh, going in order of the development, so the recent, uh, recency with which the um,
programs have been developed. So, and now at a fully online uh, campus there, Aubra, could you speak about, and, and you said about uh, three or four years now, you've been an exclusively online campus. If you could speak a little bit to the strategy or the enrollment goals that you have. Yes, well, we are constantly uh, forecasting and looking uh, to grow our program. Uh, one of the things that uh, our president and other members of the college has done is just kind of did a little small tour of our, our county and just kind of with business and industry to see what their needs are. And out of that, uh, just kind of looking at what the needs are were in our area, we realized that uh, in our school systems, they're looking uh, for individuals to have more courses where our teachers can uh, take courses or their paraprofessionals, not so much teachers, but can take courses where they can work toward their education uh, degree. And so here at the college, we, I mean, on the campus, we will begin to offer education courses. Uh, beginning in the fall, as well as human resources. Uh, there's a need in our community uh, to offer more human resource courses for individuals who are working in business and industry. And so those are two areas that, uh, programs rather, that we're looking at expanding and offering on the TCC Connect campus with hopes that we would, you know, see or that would go on our enrollments and higher enrollments. And we're also just trying to scale up uh, on our outreach to kind of reach a little bit further um, as it relates to uh, different areas where we can, you know, market our program because there are individuals that are still in our community who does not realize that, you know, TCC Connect Campus is actually a virtual campus, so we still have work to do and there's still conversations uh, that are going on now on how we're going to address our, our address, I'm sorry, our enrollment in a strategic manner. Great, yeah, and uh, looking at what is the need in the community or what is the need nationally in terms of a degree attainment, continual training, I think a lot of institutions are starting to look more closely at that from a demand perspective as opposed to a, a supply side first perspective. Um, Lorraine, your, your institution has been involved in online learning for quite some time. What do you think about the importance of um, that strategic support and, and where are you going in terms of strategy and enrollment goals? Yeah, let me maybe start with uh, uh, recruitment pieces. We, um, well, sorry. We had um, recently had a vice president of academic and student affairs under one vice president, which you could probably imagine for an institution our size was a little bit problematic. So uh, in the last couple of years, they switched that out and we have a new vice president for academic affairs that I report to and a new vice president of student affairs. So that's really allowing the college to move forward in sort of more strategic ways just because there's a little bit more bandwidth for the folks who are in the leadership roles. So um, we are, from the from before to during the recession, at the height of the recession, the online program had a 300%, like 293% growth during that time. So as somebody was saying previously, I think it might've been Sasha, we were one of those institutions that had tons and tons of courses and sections out there, but no real focus. So um, now we're really starting to focus more on completion. We're looking at guided pathways and trying to set the foundation. Um, at the same time, we're starting for the first time actually to have uh, a strategic enrollment management plan. So we're ramping up our recruit recruiting office, connecting that with our marketing department, and then also uh, doing that in coordination with academic programs. In the past, our marketing folks have really just focused on marketing the college, but not marketing for recruiting for specific programs like CTE programs or for transfer. Um, so that's a really positive shift that we're making. Um, we, as I said earlier, are part of the Achieving the Dream effort, and our effort is called YES, which stands for Yes to Equitable Student Success. So one of the primary components of that is really set setting a foundation for guided pathways, which are scheduling, uh, centralized scheduling work I mentioned earlier as part of, as well as looking at a complete redesign of our advising services and also setting metrics for what we're gonna measure because in the past we've mostly been judged on 
enrollments in FTE versus uh, completion and retention of students. So, you know, a lot of community colleges have many challenges because students don't necessarily feel like they need, if they're going to transfer, they don't necessarily feel like they care about getting that transfer degree. Um, and so that's a, a challenge for us to work on. Um, internally in the department, we are also making the shift with folks because we fund all the new development and pay for the faculty training for folks that are going to be teaching online. And so we have revised our requests and procedures and priority process to fund the things that most directly relate to student uh, full online completion. Fantastic. One of the themes that um, I've heard throughout is really that student supports piece uh, from orientation all the way through to retention and, and then to completion. And I'm wondering, uh, in retrospect, if you had the ability to go backwards and reset uh, all of your student support um, kind of in that end to end life cycle, uh, where where would you start? Um, Lorraine, I'm going to direct this question at you, and then I'm going to uh, move to Abra and Ryan to get some of their thoughts on, on what they're currently doing from a student support perspective. Sure. I guess the first thing I would say is that funding and organizational structure, you know, if I really <laughs> could have what I wanted would be different. And we are actually in the process of doing a study on our structure and organization. And so I don't, you know, we have no idea where that's going to end up, but at least there's a conversation about it. Um, but some of the things that I would, would wish for would be to have enough staff to allow for fully on students to have dedicated academic advisors um, that would include career advising. At PCC, we separate career services from academic advising. And I think it's so integral for students to be thinking about careers at the same time that they're getting academic advising. So we don't have, and we, and currently our fully online students don't have access to uh, career services counselors unless they come to campus. Um, we do have resources online. I think I would also love to see student success coaches for students. Again, we'd love to do that, but we don't have the resources now. Um, I'm sure everybody on this on this webinar knows that students can feel isolated and really lack the critical support of, you know, having at least one person at the college who knows their name that they can contact. Um, and those folks could also help provide orientation for new students. Um, we have a lot of resource centers that are available to campus students uh, that don't have remote options for fully online students. So some particular areas I think I would like to see growth in are support for veterans, um, timely virtual financial aid advising. Our folks have to uh, come on campus for that or if they're lucky schedule a phone call between eight and five. Um, and then we have, you know, women's resource center, multicultural support, queer resource centers, first generation programs, et cetera, that our folks haven't been able to tap into at all. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a real challenge. One of the things um, that we are putting into place here at Louisiana State University is that one-to-one -one model. So one learner concierge for each student so that they do have that advocate. Um, but to your funding point, we're getting some significant investment in that, and that can be really challenging for a lot of institutions. I also think that that can contribute so much to retention, particularly at the community college level. So I, I'm hopeful that you will get that funding because that, that could really have an impact for your students. Um, so, Aubra, knowing that you're in the thick of this a few years in, what student support structures have you put into place? And I know this is your area, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk to Ryan a little bit about what he might have on deck. Okay, just a little bit about um, <laughs> TCC Connect Campus. I almost have to say ditto to Lorraine. <laughs> Uh, in some regard, because we are having some challenges as it relates to, you know, our funding and organizational structure. Uh, when we first started, we were hoping on our student services side that we would just continue to grow as it relates to uh, our staffing. But that process is going just a little slow, uh, just much slower than I would like to see it, because we do not have very many services that are solely dedicated to our online population. 
uh, Lorraine actually mentioned uh, the veteran population, and we just had emails going back and forth this morning in, at the college in regards to veteran services. Well, we have no, you know, we don't have an individual on our campus to provide those services to our online students uh, uh, who are veterans, and that we have a large population of veteran students who are taking courses online. Uh, you know, many of our veterans are dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome and sometimes sitting in a physical classroom is not conducive for their learning styles. So that's a population I think we're really uh, missing uh, our opportunities to serve online. Currently, we have a financial aid coordinator, one financial aid coordinator and one registrar coordinator assigned to our campus. And as I mentioned earlier, we have 22,000 students. And so that's just scratching the surface of our needs. Uh, career services, we do not have uh, anyone online who are providing uh, that service to our online students. Our students um, pretty much have to come to campus if they want to talk to someone face to face. However, we do uh, provide uh, HETS to those students, uh, which is a Hispanic educational technology service where our students can take advantage of career services, resume writing, interview tips, and those type things that looking for, you know, how to look for a job, jobs that are available. That's a free service uh, to our students. However, we could really have someone who's uh, managing that operation. And currently we do not have anyone that's doing that. So we get a little concerned about, you know, retention persistence because we are so lean and there are so many other things that we would like to do, but we just do not have uh, the staff to do it. As I mentioned earlier, we have 13 part-time academic advisors. However, they are serving their entire district. And we have alone on the TCC Connect campus, 22,000 uh, students. So um, if we had more staff, we could really uh, make a greater impact as it relates to uh, student success and being there to provide the services that are students um, definitely need at this time. And so yeah. our, our challenge is, you know, our organizational structure. I mean, I'm, it's one vice president. I have managers. I do not have uh, directors at this time. All the, the other five campuses probably have four directors reporting to them. However, my responsibilities are very similar to uh, the other vice presidents. And we have a success coach, but we have one success coach. And we had more success coaches uh, dedicated to our online population uh, that individual could be responsible for the orientation, the onboarding process to make sure that those students are getting the information they need on the front end, you know, when they are trying to get admitted and registered here at the college. So one of our challenges is definitely uh, the funding and our organizational structure at this time. Uh, and I actually think this relates to one of the questions that we um, had submitted here, which is about what is the role of an external online program management company? Uh, if I'm correct, all three of your institutions decided to provide these resources in-house. I, I know that that is a little bit of a balancing act, right? Because you have to invest in order to grow, and then you also have to ensure that some of those resources that come back come back to the online learning division to further support, market, recruit, retain, and graduate students. So, Ryan, I don't know if that was a conversation at your college at all, but has anyone um, at their respective institutions either heard, um, been part of discussions around going with an online program management company or, or something around that? Or was that never part of the conversation? Ryan, I don't know if you want to touch on this. Or, uh, Abra, I, I'm guessing that starting the Connect campus, deciding to keep those resources in-house was a, a, a probably a no-brainer, but I'm wondering, did anyone have those conversations? Well, we really didn't have many conversations about outsourcing, um, you know, any of our services. When we began to write our prospectus for SACS, uh, we basically wrote in that, you know, our, from our startup that we would 
work with our the other five campuses to provide those services. However, now you know our campuses are filling. Um, you know that well. I'll just say some appear to be getting a little overwhelmed because they they feel like they're serving their students as well as our students, and there's just a growing need as our enrollments begin to grow. So perhaps at some point the college may look at outsourcing and how can we provide some of those sources, I mean resources to our students. But currently, uh, we're really not looking at outsources. When we looked at you know this campus, it was an in-house operation, and we would be depending on our other campuses. Got it. Um, Lorraine, from your background and the, the conversations at your institution, was an OPM ever part of the mix or was it really important to keep those um, in-house? And part of the question we received here was that, you know, the, the environment is getting increasingly complex. So we here at LSU have a, have a somewhat enviable um, situation wherein we have resources that we are devoting to marketing and recruitment, market analysis, being able to pick the appropriate programs and invest in the right places. Um, but some institutions don't have those resources and, and sometimes the OPM route might be the route to go. Uh, did Portland have any conversations around that or was the historical development really to, to build that infrastructure? I wouldn't even say it was to build the infrastructure. I think it was organic and it was driven by um, the academic departments. And I would say more recently, since we are starting to be more strategic, it is possible that we might want to contract out some services, um, but I don't, um, unless the college is gonna make a huge financial investment in the online program, I just don't even think it's possible as well as it would be a drastic culture change. So it wouldn't be resetting the online program, it would be resetting the entire institution and sort of the, the culture of you know a 52 year old community college. Uh, and that's actually a great uh, thought to kind of bring us back to, which really we had mentioned earlier is that what, what you change for online because of the complex use case scenario, you, you really can take back into operations to improve the rest of the institution and, and to help drive innovation and culture change. If you had a kind of a, a magic wand that you could use in order to um, change one component of culture that you think would be that have the biggest impact on the success of your program um, what would that thing be i don't know if anyone wants to jump into the lines then to talk about this lorraine do you have any if you had a a, a magic wand for one kind of cultural component what what would that be uh, this will probably sound bad, so hopefully what happens in the webinar stays in the webinar. I would say consistently held high value placed on serving diverse populations of students. So I think we have a ton of faculty and staff doing great work, but because of our size and the challenge in communicating and helping develop part-time faculty, et cetera, and the you know, distributed nature, um you know centralization would help that but uh if if i don't know that that's really a culture change it's really a structural change i would say sort of everybody having that heartfelt lived commitment to focusing on students first before other needs and maybe i'll just stop there Great. Um, I don't know, Ryan or Abra, do you want to um, share some thoughts about culture change or even the intentionality of it? Well, I, I think from my perspective, coming from a flagship, one of the things that I'm most interested in in terms of culture change, but this is again a structural piece to your point, Lorraine, is because my division encompasses not just support for fully online programs and online courses, but also the continuing education piece. Um, one, of the, one of the conversations that I'd like to see accelerated is around prior learning assessment and how um, those other high quality um, learning experiences maybe on the non-credit side of the house or 
um, the experiences that enable students to demonstrate competency or demonstrate their ability um, to do certain things can be translated into credit to provide pathways. And that's a little bit of a, um, a culture shift uh, for a, a more traditional flagship institution. So I'm looking forward to having those conversations. I know we do have to wrap it up, but I wanted to provide um, all of our panelists uh, with an opportunity for some parting words of wisdom. So if you had one sentence, one piece of advice for someone starting a new program, what would it be? I don't know, Ryan, if you if you can jump in it's, or... It's, it's you... easy for me. Help. Okay. No. Um, <laughs> I, I think that's why this topic was so near and dear to me. Is that, Like I said, I had the opportunity through um, uh, the folks at University of Idaho set me up early on a virtual uh, conference they did and they had a couple of weeks of sessions and through that I got to meet so many people from around the country and I just started cold emailing people and just not asking them what they would change but asking them what their experience has been from you know building up and and uh, some of the folks have been doing this for 5 10 15 years and like I said the main thing that kept coming back was that that quality piece and um, I, I think, you know, when you were just talking a minute ago about the, the culture, um, I, you know, my, my school is in a huge cultural change right now. We're going from a state technical school to a community college, and we're wanting to push a little bit more of the, the online learning and um, a little bit more of the technology use. So we do have so much change here. It is like drinking out of the, um, the fire hose. So, but yeah, I, I think for me, just that, that, that little bit would be the, the, the quality piece of getting a good quality um, online program and courses. Great. Uh, Abra, what would your one piece of advice be? <laughs> My one piece of advice would be, you know, uh, when you're starting a new program, I mean, a new campus, to make sure you have all of the players at the table, uh, to make sure that, you know, the funding is there, the human resources are there. Uh, it's just a challenge when you're trying to start a new campus, especially uh, this size with having uh, very few human resources uh, to get the day-to-day -day work done. It, it can be very challenging. And Lorraine, what's your biggest piece of advice? I think mine would be, except that as an example, Ryan's already doing it, which is really to connect and network with people who have been in the field and learn, you know, from their lessons and absolutely you know do the ask to your president which i i know him so i know he's already supportive but to the president and the executive uh, team or the cabinet to make their interest and support known because that goes so far in helping the rest of us operationalize things when the message from the top is you know we're going to do this and sometimes people don't ask that that is so true and i would just uh, echo lorraine's sentiments that um, the strategy has to be there from the very highest level of executive leadership to ensure that the resources are going to come and the support is going to come. And so um, also, Megan made a great point here, which is the WCET community is a great place to ask for advice. And I am, I stalk those listservs for advice. So um, thank you to all in the WCET community because I, I think all of us use that as a really critical resource. Uh, I did want to hand it um, over to Megan just for the last couple minutes of wrap up. Thank you to the entire panel. Great, thank you so much, Sasha, and thank you, panelists. Thank you for all the wonderful questions from the participants. We didn't have a chance to get to all those, but we'll make sure to share those with the panelists and get responses back out to you. If this is your first WCET webcast, do visit our website. We have many, many links and resources on our website. You can learn about joining WCET and the very active listserv and membership community that Sasha referenced. Our WCET 30th annual meeting is coming up in Portland, Oregon, so you can stop by and see all of us and Lorraine at Portland Community College. Registration is open and the program is posted. And again, the link to this recording as well as any other recorded webcasts that we've done recently are available on the WCET website. We have two exciting webcasts coming up, one on October 16th about the cheating economy and academic integrity. October 31st on Halloween is uh, 
webcast in partnership with OLC on web accessibility. And those are free and open to all. Thank you to our supporting members and our WCET sponsors that underwrite much of our programs and events here and make our webcast possible. Again, thank you to our presenters. This is a great discussion. Thank you to my colleague Molly McGill for helping spearhead this along with Ryan Faulkner's suggestion. So we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. Thanks all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.